Jasper. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the United States Institute of Peace, I'd like to welcome you to this event, um, which will be focusing on Liberia security sector implications and uh, perspectives from the Liberian minister. I'd like us to give a special welcome to those joining us by webcast. Unfortunately, we were not able to fit everyone in this um, room. So thank you very much for joining us by webcast. And uh, we look forward to your participation as well during um, this event. As you all know, since um, Liberia's return to um, democ democracy, we've had a lot of challenges and also a lot of opportunities and progress. And a lot of this depends on the strength, pace, and effectiveness of security sector reform in that country. And security re sector reform pertains not just to the military, but also to the police and intelligence services. And the extent to which they could effectively address the myriad of human security and hard security challenges Liberia faces um, would tell us the, how likely the, trend, the eventual transition to self-sustained sustain, um, sustainability would be in the medium term. Failure of an effective security sector reform program in Liberia would have implications not just for domestic security, but also for sub-regional security. And those of us following um, the unfolding events in Cote d'Ivoire um, know the um, dangers that this could pose. And so today we are very pleased that we have with us um, like the uh, Defense uh, Minister um, in Li from Liberia, the Honorable Brownie J. Samokai Jr., to lead this discussion. Um, those of you who have followed um, Liberia over the decades uh, would be very familiar with uh, the minister and his work. Um, in addition to being uh, the Minister for National Defense, he also chairs the Peace and Security Pillar, which is one of the four pillars uh, prioritized as a key development focus in Liberia. Um, he has a very impressive background, and you all have copies of his bio, so I wouldn't read through um, it extensively. But suffice to, ma to mention that um, he is a former director of the Liberia National Police, and so he does have a bit of credibility talking about the non-military side of security sector reform as well. He's a retired colonel from the um, Liberian Armed Forces, and he's a Fulbright scholar with a master's degree in applied economics from American University here in Washington, D.C., a kindred spirit and economist, always good to have some support. Uh, following the minister's remarks, we'll have three discussants. And the first will be Bernadette Paolo, President and CEO of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa. Um, she, her bio is also um, contained in your handouts, and she has had extensive um, experience, not just here in the United States, but also on the African continent, and we're very pleased to have her here to share her perspectives. Um, Jennifer Cook, our co-host, will be um, would we'll also be a discussant, and she'll be focusing on domestic political issues and um, how these um, pertain to um, security sector reform and broader st stability. Our third panelist will be um, Mike Bittrick, who is Deputy Director of Security Affairs in the Office of Regional and Security Affairs in the Africa Bureau at the State Department. Um, Mike Bittrick is also a, an old Africa hand, and he will be giving us a 35,000-foot uh, view of <laughs> the key policy issues and the red flags and green flags with which we should all be familiar. Um, before I invite um, the minister, I'd like to encourage us all to um, silence our cell phones, our PDAs. Um, they interfere with the um, audio equipment and uh, also potentially distracting to your neighbors and the speakers. And so without much ado, um, join me in giving a very warm welcome to um, Browning J. Samunkai, Minister of National Defense, Republic of Liberia.
let me thank uh, Dr. Gilping and the staff of uh, the CSIS for inviting me this, uh, this afternoon. And I'm very pleased uh, to be among the distinguished panel of friends and colleagues. And let me say welcome to all of you uh, this, this afternoon. I am sure there's a lot of expectations. I will hope that uh, we can try and uh, our exchange to find a better way of understanding each other given the different perspective that all of us may bring to the, to the issue. I think you are quite aware of where Liberia has been coming from, a failed state of 14 years of civil conflict, where the clear rule of law had collapsed, where the political system itself had collapsed, where the confidence in providing security for individuals in the country was no longer there. Thousands of Liberians were displaced, thousands were killed. No one had any, um, the rule of law was pretty much non-existent. And at the same time, you had an environment in which uh, women and children, the elderly and young and old were all being victimized by not only rebels, but also the state apparatus. So there was a need um, after the peace agreement of the Comprehensive Peace Accord in 2003, calling for a security sector uh, reform process. But that wasn't just the beginning call. The beginning call actually did back to 1990. In the Banju, when the peace conference call for the reform of the Liberian security sector. So in 2005, with the uh, support of the international community, the support of ECOWAS and others in the region, there was a clarion call for the security sector reform. And most specifically, countries were being asked, and in one of them in particular, the U.S. was asked to take the lead specifically in helping to reform the armed forces of Liberia. But of course, there was also the need for the reform in the police services, in the security service, in the secret services, uh, in the Bureau of Immigration, in the intelligence services, in different investigative organs of government at, uh, at that time. But the question was, um, which approach we want, we want to adapt at that point in time? Who do you investigate? What mechanism should you put in place to investigate? But there was an urgent need at that particular point in time for the maintenance of law and order. The UN by itself could not police just individuals, saying that they didn't have the right to take part in the court. So obviously the police as an institution had to be held on to see how quickly they can get into the reform process. So there was an immediate engagement between the United Nations and individual police personnel that were already in the system and then later on brought back those of them who are left. So you had the police going, helping to maintain law and order. But at the same time, you had the, uh, the armed forces of Liberia, which um, had a great opportunity when the decision was taken by Chairman Bryan in the other part of 2005 with the support of the U.S. and international community to pretty much uh, find a way to begin anew. So the decision was taken, Special Order Number 5 was signed by the Chairman of the Transitional Government and republished by the Armed Forces of Liberia High Command, thereby providing severance to the entire structure of the Armed Forces of Liberia. But as an institution, as the EFL under the law, it still remains. But those individuals in the institution themselves were provided severance. There was a huge challenge as to how do you take care of these thousands of persons. Because prior to that time, the Armed Forces of Liberia in 2000 uh, and 2004 had less than 10,000 persons. But by the time the reform process started to be, demo to be demobilized, you had roughly about 14,000 persons that needed to be demobilized in the military. You had a level over 10,000 persons in the police, another 4,000 persons in the Secret Service, another 3,000 plus persons in the immigration. So there was a whole balloon of persons within the security sector that needed to be, to be taken care of. So with that decision taken by the government and republished by the armed forces, it provided the basis for engagement by the international community and the government to find the funding to go ahead and go to the reform process. The government of Liberia didn't have any money. Uh, South Africa had to come in with at least $5 million. Nigeria also came in with some money. The host government came with some money, and I think the United States government took the brunt of it and decided to put the money up. What process would you put in place in order to go to the reform process? What were the legal basis for all of that? The process for setting up the legal basis, if we were to start, would not have allowed the reform process to take place at the same time. So what was agreed upon, apparently, was to allow the process to proceed in a way that is more systematic and then at the same time provide a legal basis to justify why those actions are being taken. As a result of that, the Armed Forces of Liberia began the process in which every individual person in the AFL 
receive severance. You had those who were the regular soldiers and those irregular soldiers. So they all received severance and were asked to now reapply through a process um, that would not distinguish anyone from whether you were, what tribe you came from, what region of the country did you come from, what was your political lineage, rather it was strictly on individual merits. So the merit based system was the basis, the initial basis for entry. And an empirical, what we call an empirical vetting process in which you have to pass, that is it involved the community, where you came from, the institution you live in, uh, your, your involvement in the Liberian conflict, or anywhere in the society, even your criminal record, and everything was checked. Each individual record was checked, not as a group, but as a person. Thirdly, we put in place a system where there was non-interference. Non there was no political interference in the process by any person, including the Minister of Defense or the Commander in Chief or any person in government or in the public or private, or private sector. Fifth, we then went across the entire country to recruit individuals so that you have a broad spectrum of all persons or all persuasions to, to come into the country. So with that background, it made it much easier for, for you to have an institution that was totally apolitical, one whose loyalty was definitely to the state, and one whose willingness to join the army was basically on the basis of the individual passing through a merit, uh, a merit system. What it therefore meant was that each person coming into the new AFL will be coming as an individual on his own choice, willing to serve, that have come in on the order of merits. To add on to that, even after passing all of those process, there was a final certification, what we call the Joint Personal Board. It comprised the U.S. government, that was the lead uh, international donor, the United Nations, uh, it comprised civil society, and of course the government, which in each person were represented by one person. Three members of that committee had voting rights with the exception of the United Nations. So any majority from those, um, from those three could send the entire process back to be reviewed. So that each person today that is in the armed forces of Liberia had to be certified by that vetting process. And then the entire training Began to, began to take place. At the same time, on the, library, on the police side, you saw where the United Nations also went into a recruiting drive, went through some process of uh, vetting, went to a recruiting grab, but it became very, very difficult to have a full mass of high school graduates who were willing to join the Liberian National Police. You can remember that because of the Civil War, people were hardly in schools, so therefore there was a lot of persons who had surpassed the age of, of, of going to school at that time, being 18 and 35 years, were staying in 8th and 9th and 10th grade. And there was a need to accelerate that process. So what happened was there was a collaboration between the, uh, the Liberian National Police, the United Nations, and the Ministry of Education and the West African Examination Council, in which a three to six months program was designed by those who were not high school graduates, but at upon certification from that program, you could then go ahead and enter the Liberian National Police. On the other side, the Bureau of Immigration, had already gone through a process of trying to restructure themselves, but did not have a lead partner. So that institution were on the waiting, if I would say, on the waiting list. Therefore, you had the armed forces of Liberia proceeding ahead on a little bit faster pace, guided by an, a country. You had the United Nations proceeding ahead with the Liberian National Police, but this time guided by an international organization. Well, the international organization doesn't have a police doctrine. So you had a combination of persons from different countries and different backgrounds, uh, whether it is from country X or country Y or country Z, they may not have the same quality of the same methodology of policing. So that was the kind of element that was introduced into the, into the Liberian National Police. So later on in future, you can see the challenges that are being faced by the police today as compared to the armed forces of Liberia. That was where a lead country like the United States took the lead process in helping to restructure the armed forces using its own trade doc, its training doctrine to impart that into, into that. But the question is, how do you then come over new leadership, a new command structure in the armed forces, when in fact you already provide severance to all of your commanders, all of the officers, all of the NCO? The alternative would have been to just call someone who had been trained in the past. Well, what if that person, for an example, had been fighting for one of the war factions? What if that person had his or her loyalty to an ethnic group or one of the groups that were fighting? Then you have to balance that with another person who, who was on the other divide, and you also had to balance that with another person. Eventually, if you were to follow that kind of process, that would have led to a complete collapse of the intent of the security sector reform. So the intent, therefore, was to put everybody through the vetting process and then bring someone who is pretty much neutral but trained that has some international credibility, that could bring international credibility to the process. 
So a decision was taken after consultation with regional and international partners to allow ECOWAS to take the lead process. And Nigeria in ECOWAS therefore took the lead and then uh, nominated, we accepted the nomination of a Nigerian to serve as a chief of staff pending the new training process that will allow a Liberian over a period of time to then assume that full position of trust as the new chief of staff. But to support that process, we identify Liberians who probably meet those minimum standards. So about 200 persons were vetted from the OEFL, and out of the initial vetting process, 99 persons crossed the first step, and then a second and more in-depth process, 11 persons qualified. So it tells you the rigidity of that process that it went to it cut across the entire board. And in order for them to come back to the EFL, all of them had to go to command and general staff colleges because none of them had. The United States provided us opportunities to send them to command and general staff college. Nigeria provided that opportunity and other, and other international partners did. So today, all of the old EFL who are senior personnel that have been brought back to the vetting process all went to complete their command and general staff college courses as an initial basis to come back to begin to assume, to assume command. So from there, from that group, one person was taken after going through a process and finally got nominated and confirmed by the Liberian Senate and became the Deputy Chief of Staff. So you now have an armed force of Liberia that have gone through a vetting process in which, is, in which there's a clear case for coming into the AFL, a pattern that have been set so that it's no longer based on an individual, politician like myself or anyone in government, but rather whoever comes to volunteer to want to enter the path through a rigid process. There are three key lessons from just the AFL side and that of the, of the Liberian National Police and the Bureau of Immigration. The first is a clear willingness on the part of the government not to get involved in the recruiting process, but rather to allow a system-driven a system process for the recruitment of individuals into the armed forces. The second thing is to have a broad-based recruiting process that is clearly transparent, that involves the local community, that involve the rest of society in the final determination as to who they want into, into, the, into the recruiting process. And the third and most important is to have an international presence that brings credibility to that process, be it regional, regional partners, institutional like ECOWAS, or a country like the United States that have a doctrine. Having the United Nations to get involved in that process, I'm not too sure the UN doesn't have a military doctrine, so I'm not quite sure you want to bring um, the UN into that kind of prayer. But they are a very key element in ensuring that there's transparency and there's no violation of any individual rights in the process. On the side of the Liberal National Police, there was a clear difficulty because on a daily basis there are law enforcement issues and law enforcement challenges that people face. You could not have disbanded that entire institution and start from scratch because criminals do not wait for police to come on. Criminals act and the police have to follow. So they therefore had to come over a makeshift process, a process of you know, illustration that will allow them to retain certain people within the institution, and then at the same time probably um, get rid of those that they think they are exorcists and then see if they can inject new blood into the system. And that was what happened to the Liberal National Police, and that is ongoing. But the challenge they faced was that uh, they needed a partner that had a doctrine. They needed a partner that had a clear system. They needed a partner that could build an institution. Whereas um, the United Nations, with all of the credibility, and I believe they really have uh, brought a lot of great work in getting the police to work, but definitely looking back and looking in the future, you want to make sure that there's a lead partner in that process, even <laughs> under the guise of the United Nations. The clear example of the sources of that was that a lead partner, that is the United States, came in and then went in and provided direct training to the emergency response unit that have now brought a good semblance of credibility to police response in our country. But were all of the institutions properly reformed? No. The Bureau of Immigration is yet to be properly popular reformed because there's a need for a lead country. However, you have a partner who has provided funding for training, but yet uh, you still have individuals that need to, be, you know, to, be, to receive severance that are, stay, uh, that are staying in the institution. The next step, therefore, was then to allow the legal basis to now come and support all of this. So the Armed Forces of Liberia then went into a drive to make sure that uh, a new defense act was crafted that would, take into the, I mean, that would take in consideration today's reality and at the same time provide a legal basis for moving forward. So in the August of 2008, the National Defense Act was finally passed. And because that act has been passed, we now have the legal basis to proceed even with the, with the, um, the activation of the Liberian Coast Guard. We now have the basis to proceed with collaboration and signing of memorandum of understanding with other countries, such as um, 
um, Sierra Leone, such as Ghana, such as Rwanda, such as Benin, uh, such as with the United States. Uh, so we have been able to sign it because we had the legal, the legal basis to do that. But what then came about was that the government itself had to then tell the Liberian people what was considered to be Liberian national security interest. So in 2007, the national security strategy was, uh, was completed and, re and released for the Liberian people as the basis for them to understand those things that have been identified as threats to the, uh, to the security sector process. So we now have the, uh, the National Security Strategy. We now have the National Defense Act. And next to that, under the armed forces of Liberia, is the, uh, the National Defense Strategy, which has just, the draft is now out. Um, it is going to what we call a validation process, a process that will allow the involvement of civil society, a process that will allow the involvement of um, um, or other think tanks such as the Governance Commission, a process that will allow for individuals out in society scholars to look at what Liberia national defense strategy is. And moving from there, our intention is therefore to proceed on the, national, on the national military strategy. If you take all of this, then finally, what you have, therefore, is that a country coming out of a country so, such as Liberia was faced with too many challenges in terms of resources, which you didn't have. So you needed a partner that would assist you with those resources. There are countries that are just emerging out of war in Liberia, for an, I mean, in, in the region, for an example, that would need to look at that, that do, they do not have the resources sources to begin to move ahead to take care of those. But what about those thousands and tens of thousands of young men and women who were demobilized? What do you do with them? So that is an option that one has to look at. So what did the government do? There was the, uh, the National Commission on Disarmament, Demobilization, Rehabilitation, and re reconstruction that was set up. And that went through a process and over 100,000 persons were demobilized. Well, but there's an Arab portion of that demobilization that needed to be considered. But that required a lot of, a lot of uh, investment, training to train these individuals, employment opportunities, and that is, that is still needed to be completed if, in fact, you want the entire uh, um, SSR process to actually take, uh, to take hold. And that process, I believe, um, although it has ended in uh, 2000 and uh, started in 2003, and I think in 2009, there is still a need because there's still a residual case of that uh, rehabilitation process and reintegration process that actually will be needed. If that one is a continuous one, or else you're going to have a relapse of individuals who took part in the, uh, in the, in the civil conflict. But these uh, threats, do you consider these 100,000 persons to be a threat? If, in fact, we consider them to be a threat to the investment that you have made, it means there's a need for the international community and a need for the country itself to begin to relook at the whole our portion, the reintegration portion, out of through jobs, through training, through education, through some form of empowerment so they can be able to, uh, to take care of themselves and their family in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the entire process. Probably during the question and answer, I might be able to go into depth to help you to probably get a direct understanding if there are some spe specifics you will want me to, to clear. So in that process, we then have to identify what are those things that we consider to be internal threats. Well, you got a pool of 100 plus thousand former combatants that have no job. That is a potential. Is it imminent? Well, it depends on how you want to look at it, but we believe it is a potential. To address that, the best option is to create an opportunity in an environment in which you have an investment that provides opportunity for them to be trained and also have jobs. Jobs would definitely serve as the best option for that individual to take care of himself, take care of his family, and become productive to society. You also have the issue and opportunity for the movement of narcotics from one end of the world, transiting through another point where coming out of a conflict environment, there's a lot of vulnerability in that uh, particular process. I think all of you are familiar with the case about uh, two and a half, three years ago, in which with the support of an international partner, France in particular, uh, a vessel was seized uh, that was moving tons and tons of cocaine at a street value of half a billion dollars. For a country whose budget at that time in 2006 was under $90 million, seizing a cocaine value of half a billion, you can imagine what would have happened if they had been able to enter the society. So that is, a, that is a potential problem that one has to look at. And then, of course, because of a failed state, you have individuals seizing and grabbing land. So land become a possession so they can get property, I mean, so they can get wealth. And because of that, it, it is now considered to be a legacy of our conflict 
that is a residual for problems to arise. If that's an internal threat, indefinitely do, we do consider that to be an internal threat. And the issue of uh, ethnicity is always there. It, regardless of which African country you go to, there's, there's always that ethnic identification. But to what extent it is prominent in the Liberian case, it hasn't yet manifested itself, but it's always a potential because if you recall in 1980 and the years uh, proceeding after that, there was a lot of ethnic concerns, particularly in those institutions of government um, uh, that were existing at the, at the, at the time. And finally, in, I mean, what we call external threats. Well, our concern, once again, it's uh, narco-trafficking, international trafficking of drugs that have a way of fueling uh, international terrorism. We are very concerned about that. Uh, illegal fishing in our waters. There's a need for the Coast Guard that are being resuscitated and uh, to come about in the place to see if we can help the police to police our waters. If you were to sum all of this process into one, you can consider it to be a very huge investment by the international community in bringing peace and stability to Liberia, a country that is very rich in mineral resources, a country that has the potential of contributing to international trade, a potential that even have driven US, huge US companies such as Chevron and international companies like BHP Billiton, Acela Metal, to go into Liberia. And the basis for going in was because of the investment potential, but also the leadership that has been brought to the country and integrity it brings on a President Sirleaf. Now, what protected all of that was because the United Nations was engaged, the international community was engaged in helping to bring peace to Liberia. If that peace were to be shattered as a result of the conflict in, its, in, in the region, obviously, it will send shivers and trembles around to the rest of us, which means that all of us have a stake in ensuring that the conflict in La Côte d'Ivoire gets the desired attention it needs. It is extremely important that addressing that conflict is not only just the conflict itself in the human dimension that it brings, but also the enormous investment that you have made in bringing peace to Liberia. That investment that ensures that there's peace and stability and there's progress in the region, a concern that has have, that have brought the United Nations to spend tens of millions of dollars and billions of dollars into the country. So it is extremely important that in order to protect that investment, we will make sure that the environment within which that investment is put is also secure. So does it mean that La Cote d'Ivoire should be left by itself? No, it shouldn't be left by itself. Should it want to be dealt with by ECOWAS? Again, our answer is no, it should not be only dealt by ECOWAS because it was not with ECOWAS blood and investment that was shared in Liberia, but also international partners did that. So it is, it is incumbent upon all of us to look at the dire need for us to support the action of ECOWAS in calling upon the international community to support and urge in, uh, the United Nations Security Council to strengthen the resolution granted to the UN mission in La Côte d'Ivoire to ensure that peace and stability can be brought on to bear. Because the Côte d'Ivoire crisis has brought several issues that Liberia has to confront with. First is the humanitarian crisis. We have over 90,000 persons as reported by the United Nations that are along the border of the 750 miles, kilometers of our borders with La Côte d'Ivoire in a location where villages are struggling to live and women and children are trying to assess the meager resources that they have. You have over 90,000 new friends and neighbors from across the border that have now crossed. That is a huge impact on the resources and the persons that are in those regions. Secondly, there's the law enforcement element as a result of that, or as a result of that kind of huge amount of persons that have crossed. Criminals, individuals involved in uh, the, tr the, the trading of arms, individuals interested in trying to fuel the conflict by benefiting from the kind of trade that takes place in coffee and cocoa, individuals who we believe that uh, like to profit from war, like in other places, the color blood diamonds. In our case, we're trying to draw your attention that we should not leave La Côte d'Ivoire to what it is today. It deserves the attention of the international community, and that attention will protect the investment that you have made in Liberia, and that attention will make sure that those women that were killed the other day those civilians who are suffering the brunt in La Côte d'Ivoire can be protected. Liberia stand very firmly in supporting the ECOWAS position. Liberia stand very firmly in supporting what ECOWAS has decided. And we believe it is in our best interest that the international community to us to come and support ECOWAS to urge the United Nations to take the appropriate stand as its desire uh, in order to bring, to bring peace. But let me say this to you. Whatever happens in La Côte d'Ivoire, whatever peace that brings in La Côte d'Ivoire, Liberia stand to face it at all times. Why? Out on the humanitarian side, 
either on the security element side or on the issue of individuals who are traumatized as a result of the conflict and then come back into Liberia. So either way we do, there's an urgency here that we need to ensure that that, thresh, that benchmark we have set, when you see that benchmark occurring, it means we in the international community have not done far enough. And that benchmark is when that lady or child at the border, at the Liberian border, begins to take the luggage and bags and little belongings that she or he have to put on her head and once again run, it means we as a region and as an international community have not responded effectively in helping to stop and avert that child from once again running away. So it is an urgent call for us to see what we can do to assist uh, and help to bring peace to Liberia. Finally, Liberia is doing all it, all, all it can to support the appeal of ECOWAS and the African Union to the United Nations to act with urgency in strengthening the UN mission in La Côte d'Ivoire. In addition, Liberia is doing all it can using its meager resources to cater in the best way possible to accommodate the growing number of refugees that are coming along its border. With a very low budget, Liberia is investing in providing security for those tens of thousands of people that have crossed. We we'll call upon the international community to come and assist not only Liberia, but to also support the urgent appeal by UN organs in providing funding to help to bring peace to Liberia. I hope I will have provided you with some basis for discussions later on in, uh, in the whole context of the security sector reform process that is taking place in Liberia and how the impact also and the Avarian conflict impact also on Liberia. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that excellent overview. We'll now have three discussants. Um, Bernadette Palo will go first, Mike Wittrick second, and Jennifer Cook will wrap up. Good afternoon, Minister Samukai, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to thank you, Raymond, Raymond Gilpin, for organizing this, and the United States Institute of Peace, and of course, Jennifer Cook and Sice. This is a very timely and necessary discussion. Those of us who have studied Liberia for a very long time remember those 14 years of civil war, and we're very grateful for the eight years of stability that we've uh, seen. And I want to commend you, Minister, and uh, uh, the government of Liberia for that. But Liberia's recovery is not over. And the challenges on the eve of elections and in the face of more than, according today to UNHCR and press reports of today, 100,000 refugees are now in Liberia, uh, in Nimba County alone. And um, so these security concerns that have been set forth by the minister have been exacerbated considerably. I'm a member of Cote d'Ivoire Watch, and we've been working for three months studying the situation in Cote d'Ivoire, working with the Department of State, with the Subcommittee on Africa on the Hill. So I must tell you, there's a great deal of frustration. Frustration because we feel that our government has worked really hard, our president has sent all the right signals, and, and the international community as well, and the AU and ECOWAS and EU, but President, former President Bagbo shows no signs whatsoever of relenting. Um, just yesterday, he wanted to impose a tax on cocoa to somehow safeguard his regime from sanctions that we're trying to level. So it begs the question, will a legitimate force and Africans have to lead this charge, combined of ECOWAS, the AU, and the United Nations have to go into Cote d'Ivoire eventually. Uh, it is nothing that we want to contemplate at this moment, but as far as the current situation is concerned and how quickly the number of refugees are escalating, in addition to the fact that there are now on the ground in Cote d'Ivoire itself one, over one million displaced people. Now, with respect to security, um, the minister has touched about, along on many of these points, but UNMIL, the UN mission in Liberia, has been in Liberia since 2003 and has increased its military and police presence at the Liberian Cote d'Ivoire border, and, and as the minister said, it's 700 kilometers. And dot along that 
border are more than 70 villages. In some of those villages pr uh, presently, there are more refugees than there are Liberians, which poses a great problem. There's a great concern about arms um, being taken into Liberia, particularly in view of the Liberian government's efforts to disarm non-combatants. According to the UN Security Council recently, uh, there are an estimated 2,000 Liberian former fighters associated with Ivorian militias who remain on the Liberian side of the border. And that's a potentially explosive situation. With the upcoming elections especially, there are concerns about Liberians feeling safe not only to register for those elections but to ultimately vote in them. A recommendation here that was proffered by the minister and which we hardly support would be to engage more um, support, financial and military assistance in coordination with the government of Liberia and UNMIL for both support with the troops as uh, the special envoy from UNMIL said that the Pakistanis, for example, sent troops that were of great help to UNMIL in Liberia. Um, so this is really important for the future. It's, UNMIL is very much underfunded at the moment. Uh, to give you an example with respect to security and the problems that they're having, recently there was a report that said that President Johnson Sirleaf sent 20 members of the security forces to a village to try to monitor uh, the, the stem, the flow of refugees and try to disarm people and see what was coming in. It was extremely difficult because it constituted her entire force for this particular region. With respect to the humanitarian situation, in total some 116,000 Ivorians have fled not only to Liberia, which is a problem for the sub-region, but to eight Western countries since this post-election crisis started. To, started including Ghana and Togo, Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, Benin, and Nigeria. Nigeria with the fewest amount to date. And in, despite the incredible hospitality of the Liberians and the aid of the Liberian Red Cross and the government of Liberia, UNHCR, the World Food Program, ICRC, Doctors Without Borders, and many other entities, the population's access to help is very difficult, particularly in the western region. Some health centers no longer function, according to UNHCR, lacking drugs and medical supplies. Medical staff have left and some of the hospitals have been looted. Medical structures are overwhelmingly affected by hygiene issues and the lack of safe water. Liberia's medical supplies are overwhelmed as well. There are only two hospitals in Nimba. Now, the number of refugees in Nimba alone estimated at $100,000, uh, 100,000 refugees as of today, where both locals and refugees are being treated, in addition to a few mobile clinics. There are respiratory infections, water diarrhea, and malaria that are the biggest issues. There are large numbers of is refugees also in Grand De uh, Gede and Maryland counties. In the past week alone, 100,000 Liberians will be officially registered in this region. That's all of the border of Liberia with 37,000 in Ghana and Togo. There is an urgent need for more support from the international community. To illustrate this point, there was a UN Security Council report on February 14th. In that report, it addressed the humanitarian crisis and called for an action plan for Liberia and asked for $55 million for the potential influx of refugees. That number then was in estimated at 50,000. That is doubled even before April, when the most refugees were expected. As far as implications for the regions, with refugees now spilling over into several countries, not including Liberia, the threat Cote d'Ivoire poses to stability and future prosperity and economic growth is huge. In a recent Reuters release dated March 23rd, 
President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf categorized the apparent dangers as a war. She said, and I quote, we're already at war. We hope there will be a, not be an escalation of war. And she was referring here to the compendium of issues that these refugees represent. This war is threatening peace, investment, and the well-being of the region. In the face of the many other crises facing the international community, it is important, it is critical, in fact, that this matter does not become less relevant. What were 320 deaths two weeks ago now approach nearly 500 deaths. What were 79,000 refugees a week and a half ago is now estimated to be over 100,000 refugees. While we hear over and over that this is an African problem that necessitates an African solution, it is an international problem that necessitates the direct assistance of the international community writ large. At a recent forum convened at Howard University uh, by the Africa Society, by Cote d'Ivoire Watch, and by the Ralph Bunch Center, I spoke with a close associate of Mr. Bagbo's afterwards, and I was told by her that the fight has just begun, that they will keep on fighting and that it will escalate. <coughs> The question I pose today is, how much can Liberians take? How much can Liberians take, West Africans, and how much can Africa tolerate? And what does this mean for the 17 other elections that are coming up in the near future? It is a dangerous precedent that must not be allowed to stand. Um, one thing we can do with respect to this crisis, because many people feel really frustrated, is to find out how you can contribute to UNHCR, Doctors Without or Borders, very quickly. And there is a resolution in the Congress, HR 85, uh, that should be passed to show the solidarity of the United States Congress. But the most important thing, again, is to keep this on the radar and to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that President Ouattara assumes his role in the very near future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to USIP, and thank you to CSIS, um, uh, Minister Samakai. It's uh, great to be back and to hear from you, uh, from your heart, and uh, for all other distinguished colleagues here uh, this afternoon. This is really an important opportunity, uh, not only to assess the, the near-term challenges uh, faced in the region from instability and a lack of governance and an inability to follow through on uh, the elections that were properly held and, uh, um, and a winner chosen in Cote d'Ivoire, but also to step back for a moment and to consider where we are as, a, as, an, as an international community in supporting the vision of our Liberian partners at this key juncture in their history, uh, eight years after uh, the, the, this comp comprehensive peace agreement was signed. Um, I think it's important, uh, after hearing Minister Samakai, um, I've recognized that there's a clone. You didn't know this, but you, there's a clone in the Department of State. Uh, for Minister Samakai actually has a clone. Um, and I want to introduce all of you to her uh, this afternoon. Her name is Susan McCarty. So if you stand up, Susan. But very important to acknowledge her uh, in this gathering. Um, Susan has been single-handedly responsible for providing uh, a large measure of the United States government support in close collaboration with colleagues from the Department of Defense and, and USAID, I should acknowledge, and, uh, and also our, our uh, corporations that work uh, so well in providing uh, this kind of support in these post-conflict cir circumstances. Susan has, Susan has been responsible for overseeing over $200 million uh, of, of programming, and that's been highly, uh, I think, as uh, per Minister Samakai's remarks, has had some uh, incredible impact. And I just want to say, uh, good, thank you, Susan, and acknowledge it publicly here. Um, 
I also want to say that it's a pleasure for me to be here to memorialize th at this time because to consider where we are in, in and make this assessment at this time because uh, this is a little bit of a history that maybe only I think Ambassador Blaney is the only person in this room who knows. Uh, I actually was involved in the Liberia peace process uh, back in 2003 while I was uh, looking at my belly and uh, my desk looking considering Sudan issues mostly. Uh, they, we got a call up to say you we, the United States Department of State, need to engage in the reform effort, not the reform, the, the conflict uh, ending efforts, the conflict resolution efforts in Liberia, uh, and we need a team to go to Ag Agbamaso, Ghana, uh, into, in, in June. And I was one of the members of the team that got to go and sit down during those negotiations. The ECOWAS-led negotiations, African solutions, clearly led by Africans, and be able to, as the United States providing its representation and supporting ECOWAS at that key juncture, it was a pleasure for me to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm thankful that how far we've come in eight years is totally, completely amazing. It's miraculous. And I think we, it bears much reflection here this afternoon. And it's, you know, taking lessons from Sierra Leone, which occurred, remember, 2000, 2001, the terrible events in Freetown, right there in our in our rear, rear view mirror and sitting down at the table and looking at the circumstances in, in, in uh, Monrovia and in uh, Nimba and Lofa counties and other parts of Liberia and considering where that, what was happening then and looking and seeing what Sierra Leone looked at, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, focus and a real desire by the parties at that time to get serious. Most important, of course, in that negotiation was the engagement of civil society. I think that, again, this was mostly the ECOWAS-led negotiation who brought civil society in. Um, uh, a president, uh, now a president of Liberia, in fact, uh, was one of the key uh, individuals in those negotiations. And without her influence, without the involvement and engagement of the women of Liberia, without the involvement and engagement of some of the other civil society actors, we would not be where we are in terms of the evolution of the process here today. And engaging and having an active civil society role in even the in in these peace negotiations is also key to their success. It isn't just a matter of bringing the military's, uh, you know, the combatants' leadership around the table and beating them into some common sense. It's also important to engage and have robustly uh, sitting around the table engagement by civil society. Um, we have been, uh, as noted, uh, providing a lot of support over the past uh, several years. And uh, where we have learned a lot is that uh, these programs must be holistic. Uh, while it is easy, simple, I could say, to equip and train a unit to conduct a mission uh, on the police side as a beat cop or on the military side as a deployed infantry platoon, it's a whole different ball game when it comes to developing institutions that can, uh, that can manage for the long haul. And in this post-conflict dynamic we see, if we've seen in Liberia, it has been quite a, a real, has been a real, real challenge. I think one of the key aspects of that um, approach that was unique in Liberia that the minister mentioned bears reflection by all of us, the de decision to demobilize all of the combatants. That was new, different, strange, and for many, a risky engagement. Because what do you do when you demobilize all of the combatants? Well, there's a lot of your future leaders. And so now, as we uh, s reflect on that decision within the Armed Forces of Liberia to take that approach, we have had to be very um, ingenious in ensuring that the senior level management of these structures can meet the requirements for dealing with human resources management, logistics, budget, medical, all of these systems, develop a system of systems within Liberia for on the military side on one hand where, they're, where we're taking all the potential cadre off the market so to speak because we don't want the damaged goods of the past. And when we try to project ahead without that uh, human capital, it can make for a difficult sort of development journey. 
one of the things that has been uh, cleverly thought through and working well with our partners here is ensuring technical support, advisory support at multiple levels within the AFL. Minister Skamakai mentioned ECOWAS, that contribution has been vital. We also have been able, the United States has provided a certain amount of support and others have as well. I think should also note that in a number of these areas, it really hasn't been just the United States, just the UN. There's been other partners around the table and I, it's important to acknowledge that and to, to understand and see e even the case of uh, the four major facilities that comprise the Armed Forces of Liberia include one, three built and refurbished by the United States and one built and refurbished by China. Okay, so it, it's really got to be in these sort of, in sort of these efforts, it's got to be a multifaceted approach. We will not succeed without it. The challenges of uh, development are, are really right in our, our, our perspective here every day. Uh, and what I mean by that is that developing the talent you need to run complex systems cannot be done in a day. And how do you manage internally the conflict mitigation challenges that you've got in Liberia and have it Liberian owned? This is a key question. We believe that in a number of places, Nimba and Lofa counties, for example, Monrovia on certain days of the week, it's difficult to see how, you know, it's, how are we going to work through these crises. Increasingly, we're seeing, if you look at the perspective of 2003 to today, Liberian ownership more and more. Is it the level that the Liberian people want at this stage? Maybe not. Not all the institutions are wholly Liberian owned. But is that the direction clearly forecast and seen? And are we seeing progress in that? I think uh, clearly the case is yes. And we are going, we, the, the, on our part, on the U.S. government side, want to be able to apply the resources in the smartest possible way to fill those gaps and help uh, Liberia move forward. One of the interesting things that we thought through is dealing with the conflict mitigation challenges you have in the short term, some of the, the parts, uh, you know, various areas, uh, dealing with those challenges while at the same time ensuring that it's not only the UN that's called on to provide the support to answering those challenges. One of the things we want to do is deal with community-based leadership development. We need alternative conflict resolution mechanisms and Liberian community leaders want to be able to be empowered to, to be able to sit around the table and bring uh, various ethnic communities, various uh, yeah, various groups around the table and be able to work through those. One of the things that we're uh, hoping to move forward on very quickly is a uh, Department of Defense 1207 project to do alternative dispute resolution work in NIMBA and LOFA and give tools uh, to our Liberian colleagues so that community leaders can be the first line of defense to mitigate challenges. What's nothing worse than bringing the AFL out to be the hammer to deal with local issues. First of all, the ha as administrators said, the hammer's not yet ready to be brought out to deal with those local issues, even if you wanted to bring a hammer to deal with the local issues. It really is the LNP and the Liberian National Police. And of course, we have also key institutions that have been supported by the international community, the Emergency Response Unit, and uh, as well as the, the PSU. Those elements have been uh, and will be with increasing capability be the, the non-hammer applied. So community, local-based community uh, alternative dispute rec resolution in a transition and transitioning justice systems, that's the first line of defense in co the conflict uh, challenge and then increasingly the, the police. One of the goals we have, of course, is to withdraw the UN forces. That's a key benchmark of the success of our post-conflict demobilization and security system reform efforts. And we uh, on the international, international community side see a good, uh, we've seen some withdrawal of UN, but I think there's some hesitance to be able to go forward quickly as long as our Liberian partners don't have the complete wherewithal uh, to uh, to uh, stand up all of their systems. 
So that's a, that's a work and an effort in progress. We also want to see a greater cooperation regionally. The minister mentioned the need to think not just about Cote d'Ivoire, but also about Sierra Leone and, Lib and, uh, and Guinea. Guinea has gone through incredible transformation in that country's history. And it's vital that the Mono River states at this stage in their, uh, uh, their own national progress to be able to work increasingly together. You mentioned the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the BIN, the Bureau of Inf Immigration and Naturalization. Uh, that's, uh, that's, they're going to have an increased role in the future here. Um, so one last comment in terms of what the uh, partners should be thinking about. Uh, Number one, conflict mitigation efforts outside of Monrovia are important. It isn't just about Monrovia. It's about other parts. If we look at history, there's a clearly been a need to focus on uh, uh, these all counties within, uh, within Liberia. Um, it also goes without saying that if you're resourcing security sector reform and the U.S. is coming up with $200 million to support defense reform, there may be some other entities that also deserve a little bit of support. And for international partners, uh, clearly uh, the LNP and the uh, SPU and PSU merit uh, support uh, as well, and additional resources should be brought to bear to assist those professionalization and uh, th those professionalization efforts. Also, of course, assistance to the BIN, as I mentioned earlier, and we are also looking at doing some conferences to help harmonize and strengthen Mono River work together. And finally, it goes without saying, without greater capital investment, both domestic and foreign, uh, this, is, this is really where uh, Liberia's future has to be. It isn't about dealing with more tactical conflict mitigation steps where we're going to make our most progress in Liberia. It's when we see 85% uh, illiteracy uh, turned into 25% illiteracy. It's when we have jobs that are locally based. It's when we have investments in ed education uh, and then in Liberian teachers training Liberian students. It will be when we have agricultural inputs uh, on the Liberian side uh, that can address the need for livelihoods and not be all externally driven. And then finally, we do need more money for the roads, please. Uh, a few dollars that way is a great help and it also provides livelihoods for locals. One of the things that we've tried to do in our security sector reform efforts is employ, and I think our contractors, our private companies on the U.S. side have been faithful to this, is employ to the maximum extent possible uh, our Liberian partners, and not only employ them, but then train them to run the systems themselves. That's our approach, uh, and I appreciate uh, expressing that uh, publicly here to say, uh, say that I appreciate that from some of our folks here. Um, that's all. really know if my remarks uh, warrant the podium. <laughs> Much of I think of... Okay, okay. Well, they're pretty... Great. Well, um, thanks, Raymond and fellow panelists. And really, um, thank you, Minister Samakai. It's just great to see you um, and uh, hear about the progress you've been making. It's been a long, hard road, I, I imagine. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, Liberia's internal security threats and perhaps the implications of Cote d'Ivoire, but it seems a little rich to lecture the, the Minister of Defense <laughs> on that. So I thought I'd take a step back a little bit and um, some of the questions that the panel discussion raised for me that maybe you can begin to answer in question and answer and maybe they get elaborated um, in the discussion period. One, it strikes me, you know, the, the massive challenge of what Liberia has tried to undertake, which is really security sector reform or security sector formation on the fly. So it, coming out of civil war, when you're uh, faced with imminent security threats, um, uh, you know, the aftermath of the war, the crisis in Cote d'Ivoire, 
Um, the idea, as you said, that you know criminals are not waiting for uh, your security sector to be up and running and functional, and that the decisions have to be made in a context where um, uh, you need immediate results on certain things, um, but you're also planning for the longer term. Also the fact that when you're coming out of that kind of a prolonged crisis, pretty much any money is welcome. <laughs> and there's, there's not a whole lot of opportunity to say, you know, we need a little more here and probably some of that could probably be used over there. And I don't, I, you know, that's, that's a problem of post-conflict reconstruction more broadly. Um, but I think, uh, again, um, the idea that that you're trying to balance multiple funding flows against a huge raft of priorities is particularly difficult. Um, an Ethiopian uh, general uh, told me, um, you know, what it is what you do today doesn't determine your military or your security forces of today or tomorrow. It really determines your forces of 10, 15 years from now. And that kind of made me think uh, in, in this context, we're talking about security sector reform for what? or building uh, security forces to what purpose? Is the, is the objective to build kind of an all-purpose security sector that can, that can respond to any eventuality um, or, to, or just build basic competence that hopefully you can, you can expand over time? Or do you prioritize what, what you're aiming for? There's a number of imminent threats right now, I think, and, and um, uh, Bernadette outlined them, I think that the Liberian Defense Force is not going to be prepared for uh, uh, to handle alone. But what are you thinking 5, 15, 10, 15 years down the line as, as the most likely threats that Liberia is going to be facing? I wondered if you might elaborate perhaps in the discussion kind of what, what the response is right now in terms of the implications of what's happening in Cote d'Ivoire. Obviously, you have an unfolding humanitarian crisis massive refugee uh, flows. Is this an opportunity, for example, to be kind of embedding these newly trained or uh, in the midst of being training Liberian security forces with UN forces to on, on crisis response and humanitarian response in a way that's kind of that, that's, that's, that's measured and kind of overseen and taken kind of within the umbrella of the UN presence right now? The UN, uh, given uh, budget constraints and uh, you know the outlook for international donors, is not going to be there forever. Um, uh, it will likely leave before you want it to, or before you f feel fully prepared. And and are there ways to take advantage of of that opportunity while it's there? In terms of the Im imminent threats, I think the possibility of re reigniting uh, some of the militia groups, uh, Model, NPFL. Um, and do they play a role not only in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, but perhaps, and I think this is the tragedy of the Cote d'Ivoire example, um, in, in perhaps destabilizing an uh, Ivoirian, uh, I mean, sorry, a, a Liberian election down the line. Um, the idea of a close election standoff, say, fought between uh, uh, the president and uh, a close contender uh, standoff, is that a possibility that, that worries you? How, um, I wonder if you might, I, and I, you're not going to want to comment on that specifically, but I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that the crisis in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the, the, the kind of precedent that it sets, that's, that's why in, in large part this crisis is so, um, uh, so uh, alarming. So the border refugee issue, um, and the election security issues. These are kind of the near-term threats. But what, when you're looking out 5, 10, 15 years from now, um, one hopes that kind of the interstate conflict and this kind of Ivoirian uh, standoff becomes uh, less of the norm. I think there's been pretty genuine progress, particularly in ECOWAS, and, and ECOWAS's responses diplomatically and militarily uh, over time in responding and pushing back to that kind of flagrant um, uh, undermining of electoral processes. What are the big challenges down the line that you see? Um, and is it, is it a military or is the military force as you're building it now that's going to be most suited to that? Are there other aspects of the security sector? You did mention um, the national police, but when you think of the kinds of conflicts uh, that probably are most likely over the longer term, 
uh, conflict over land, which you mentioned, uh, and communal violence, the issue of vigilantism, um, emergency responses and, and, and refugee flows, food security and riots, and, and Li Liberia has seen those, the issue of narcotics that you mentioned, uh, illegal resource exploitation, uh, timber, uh, other, other resources. And I would say, eventually, um, you know, Liberia will turn its eyes to the opportunities of kind of maritime security and so forth. Um, and, and what are you building now in terms of those kind of longer range issues? Uh, we, we have a, a project right now on police reform. Uh, we're, we're realizing how incredibly complex that is to do here in the United States. I imagine it's no less easy in, in Liberia. Um, but, you know, our, are we getting the balance right in Liberia? I guess that brings me to, to my final point. Uh, resources are finite. You know, it would be great to, to say more on police, more on roads, more on reintegration and job employment and income generation. But, you know, there may be some efficiencies we can find and some greater resources we can find. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to make <coughs> trade-offs. And the U.S. will, the donor community will have to make those trade-offs. And I think the Liberian government will have to make trade-offs. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the key challenges right now. How do you set those priorities? I'd say within the military, do you want to be building specific capacities that are most relevant to Liberia? Within the security sector, is it the military or is it going to be a, a, a gendarmerie type force or is it going to be the police force that's most uh, relevant to the security challenges that Liberia faces over time? Uh, or is it across sectors? Look, we're spending a lot on security sector reform. Are we really doing enough in terms of income generation and, 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 and reintegration where, as you said, the real source of, of the um, uh, many of the problems come? I think, uh, you know, that, that's an issue that every single country has to grapple with. We're grappling with our budget arguments in, in Congress right now. But I think it's particularly important in a place that's, that's very <laughs> fragile, uh, that is still fairly heavily reliant on external, uh, external funding and really has to kind of set the priorities itself unless it wants to get battened about by, you know, the, 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 the fads and vagaries of international donors. So my question to you is, is Liberia getting the balance right? Is the international community um, getting the balance right? And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'll, I'll end there um, and uh, turn it over to questions and answers. to the entire panel for those very um, insightful comments. Um, I think we've managed to um, contextualize the uh, challenges being faced by uh, Liberia at this time and challenges they're likely to face um, five, ten years hence. And the question is, um, the overarching question is, to what extent has the um, reform process in Liberia's security sector um, prepare the country to meet those challenges head on and make progress. Um, Jennifer has outlined and summarized the issues um, brilliantly. Um, but before I invite um, the minister and probably some of the panelists to comment, um, time is far spent, so I'll also invite about three or four questions. If you can make your questions as short and as directed as possible, that would help and enable us to um, get enough food for thought for the panel to respond. <coughs> I think we have the lady here as the first. There's a microphone coming. Please identify yourself Hi. and uh, please make your question short. <laughs> Hi, um, Sia Willie, Howard University, African Studies Program. Thank you, Minister um, Samka, as well as those on the panel. Um, I want to thank you for your efforts and your sacrifices in serving Liberia. But my question regards corruption, accumulation, as well as inequality that is breeding um, and its effect on national security. Uh, obviously we know that with debt forgiveness and so forth, uh, Liberia has accumulated much capital and liquidity that is needed to spearhead and, and move forward a lot of uh, reconstructive, reconstruction efforts. However, corruption is paramount, it's ubiquitous, and how do you see that impacting state security? Thank you. We'll take one from the gentleman. 
I'm William Hare from the University of the District of Columbia. And, uh, Honorable Minister, it's great to see you. My classmate, Fulbright classmate. <laughs> Actually, um, this morning I read a very alarming article. And what it said, George Weir said, if in fact the chairman of the election commission was not changed, what is happening in the Ivory Coast would be nothing compared to what will happen in Liberia. And I think clearly what you purported in terms of the security sector reform, how prepared are we and what are we going to do in terms of civil disobedience based on the number of, of ex-combatants that could potentially destabilize the system based on opposition leadership. I think this is extremely critical. Thank you. Thank you. There was a gentleman here. Hello, I'm Daniel Levine from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Of course, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my question for the minister primarily is, Given how unusual the step of demobilizing more or less the entire security sector was in Liberia, I'm curious, after eight years of experience with this, what implications you think the successes and failures of that model have for other kinds of SSR projects where integration of forces into the security sector has been part of the peace deal made? And we'll take uh, one more from this side. Anyone on this side? Yes, you look. Uh, Joel Burbank from the Fund for Peace. Uh, I was wondering if there has been any consideration for how the voluntary principles on security and, and human rights might contribute to the uh, security sector reform process in Liberia as has been, been done in other countries such as Colombia. Okay, I think we have quite a full plate. And um, uh, it's all for you, uh, Minister. <laughs> oh, you, you can take it from there. Oh, no, sorry. Thank you for those uh, very challenging questions. I, I don't know where to start from, but uh, if I will, if just allow me to take you from Dr. James Tia Tape, an architect of the, uh, the Liberian peace process since 1990. He's sitting right in the back. There's when you see Dr. Tape. Um, Let me say that um, everything that has been asked are very important questions. And I think answers uh, may not necessarily satisfy you, but I'd like you to see the reality from which we are, we are coming from. Whether it is the issue of corruption and inequality and its effect on national security, what is the threat from any individual um, with regards to their desire to have some changes made in the Elections Commission, or what is the issue of demobilization of the security sector that have taken place or even the issue of voluntary security as an example by the local community. One has to see the reality that uh, decision makers face when in the transition process. It is much easier to state what you think when the responsibility of people's lives are not in your hands. When it is, when people's lives, uh, decisions that they make affect them, then one has to be very conscious on the decision, on the decision taking. Let's take the example of corruption. Yes, corruption didn't start today under the present leadership of Madam Salif. She has stated from day one that it was an endemic problem in the society. There has to be a final way to resolve that problem. There has to be a way to deal with the problem. What are the steps that one would need to take to address those problems? It's the first look at the issue of the rule of law. Strengthen the judicial system so that you can have the courts more relevant, more independent to be able to prosecute cases that come before the, come before the courts. What do you need to, to, to deal with the issue of corruption? It's to have system, process, and procedures and accountability mechanism put in place to make sure that you have them independent enough to be able to deal with the issue of corruption. What do you need also to tackle corruption? Is to have an independent um, uh, general accounting office that would deal with these, with these kind of issues. So you have a robust auditor general to be able to address those issues. What do you need to put in place? You need to have 
an anti-corruption commission that is independent enough to be able to deal with that. Now, when you put all of this into place, and individuals are taken to court, and the court declares the person free, we will ask you to kindly give us an options after the court have taken a decision. We'll be very glad to follow those examples. Because President Salif has been able to have individuals sent to court that need to be prosecuted with the evidence presented to the court, overwhelming evidence. And yet, our jury system comes back and say, well, not guilty. So, I mean, we would definitely be glad. I would take it back to Madam Salif. I say, coming from this panel, these are the suggestions when the court said not guilty. And I'm sure she'll be glad to, uh, to, look, uh, to look into that. But again, when you then look at a system where you need to restructure the whole process, look at the military. Here was the military with the constitutional responsibility to protect the citizens. Well, the entire military got somehow wrapped up in the entire conflict. You have a general who left the army and went to form his own, his own unit. You have a colonel who left to go form his own unit. You have individuals from here who want to go form his own unit. Everybody got brawled into the entire conflict. What should we do? How do we then investigate each individual person of the 10,000 plus persons in the armed forces? The best alternative was then we we'll leave them there. Does it solve the problem? No, it doesn't. But then how do you then take an individual out? What would be the rationale for doing that? So the best thing was to put a system in place that said, okay, here you are. If you want to come back, fine, but these are the processes that you have to follow. First, you must be a high school graduate of a YX certificate in order to join the Army. Second, if you want to become an officer, you must have a college degree. Third, you must be able to show that you passed a diagnostic test. You must be physically fit. You must have a medical certificate. These are all broad uh, requirements and criteria in every professional military around the world. And of crucial importance is a complete buy-in by civil society and the local population. How do you get civil society and local population involved? Is to put their names on the bulletin board out there in the community. Go to the community and ask them, this is the phone number. Call this number if you have any derogatory information on any one of these individuals. And that was what Liberia did. Give everybody the chance and opportunity, not how fast you can shoot or how, I mean, how big a gun you can handle. So that was how come those who didn't meet the criteria under the vetting process did not get selected. Do we have former AFL personnel in the, in the new armed forces today? The answer is yes. Do we have persons who took up arms in the Liberian conflict? The answer is yes. Are they from all walks of life? The answer is yes. But yet these individuals met all of the criteria in order for them to be selected. Criteria that was judged by the international community, criteria that was judged by the international partner in the U.S., judged by ECOWAS, judged by the United Nations, judged by civil society. I do not believe that those actions taken would have been any different from anywhere where there was a need for security sector reform to take place. So that was the basis upon which uh, uh, um, that happened in the EFL. And more besides, the military, as a matter of fact, was not needed at that time, where you could say you need conscript to go to the battlefront to fight. Whereas on the issue of law enforcement, crimes take place every day, incidents take place every day, the traffic violation on a daily basis, so there had to be an institution, there had to be some person that one has to rely upon, as imperfect as it may be, but you need a law enforcement person to be out on the street. That should give you the time to allow you to go through a reform process of the police institution, and that is exactly what, uh, what we, we are heading towards at this point in time. Um, voluntary security, we have the community watch teams. Community watch teams that's in different communities, in which, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a radio program that comes in at midnight, and people call in whenever there's a security incident. People call about what is happening in your community, and that provides an alert for the police to respond. Now, we need to work on their response times, yes. We need to make sure that they have the means to communicate, of course we need to. The ability to get there on time, we definitely need them to do that. For them to have the wherewithal, like, like Mark mentioned, the PSU, the police support unit, yes, we need to have them capable to be able to, to do that. But how will we respond to uh, individuals who want to stay demonstration at time violence? That is something we have to learn. Have person been trained? Yes. Nigeria trained about 200 of those individuals. Are they being supported? Yes. The United States have come out now to support the police support unit in the Library of National Police where there's a gradual response to incident instead of using lethal weapons. So we have individuals that are now trained on riot and crowd control and how to engage. Are they experts? No. 
Will they need to learn? Yes. Will there be mistakes along the way? Absolutely there will be, but we have to learn from those mistakes. So we are not shying away from being willing to learn. Neither are we saying that we are experts now. We are simply saying we are working and gradually improving on the programs that have been set to make sure that we have a very good environment heading to elections in, uh, in October or sometime later on uh, this year. So I hope I was able to answer some of these questions. But I want you to kindly see where decisions that we make affects the process. Say, for example, if we were to wait in 2005 when Ambassador Blaney and others were there and say, you know what, let's wait with the security sector reform until we can pass all the laws. You know how long it takes to pass a law. It's no different in Liberia. So you would have had uh, a band of people running around, and it would have had no chance to do that. So we had to take some immediate steps. So those are the steps that were taken at the time, and I hope uh, you know, those steps can be built upon. And Madam Sully, Madam President, is very, very conscious of these issues. She's very serious of them, and she takes them very seriously. She talks about it on a regular and on a daily basis at the steps to be, to be taken. But granted that you have the authority as an independent person on the, um, as the Auditor General, for an example, I think one has a moral responsibility to respect the high office of the president. So you may have been reading some stuff in the, in the Y in the newspapers. One has to recognize your limits, even here in the United States. One cannot just get up and make a statement and write something against your boss and your command in chief in a way and actions taken and then you say something. He's a very competent individual. He knows exactly the work, but also one has a responsibility even with your level of competence. Thank you. Um, I think we are running out of time. Do we have time for two or three final questions? Maybe just two. We had the uh, gentleman at the back whose hand was up. I began. Mine is, uh, <clears throat> has to do with our recourse and how the international community by uh, SD default is leading to a regional crisis. The international community does not vote, but the result of the Africa vote is presented as if the international community has decided they want Mr. Watara, and so Mr. Watara you must have. Who says that? There are two institutions that were part of that voting process. National Independent National Election Commission and the Constitutional Council. The commission does the work of the fourth work to get the votes done and they present their report to the council, which is the government's body for making final decisions. But according to the reports some of us have received, the election commission man was taken to one uh, hotel where Mr. Watara was and declare him president. So the constitutional man who's supposed to be making <clears throat> the final decision said, well, if God one president, they have gave us one on this side, and then we balance it. What are the issues? The issue basically is to now go back and look at the institutional formation of these organizations and do an assessment of each and establish an a commission of international elders, uh, experts, eminent people, to look in detail. Because the issue is not whether Babo becomes or remains president or Ouattara remains president. Because the conflict in Africa, after years of slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, is to work for unity and development. We cannot sit back and say, we are going to fight war in Africa over whether Ouattara will be president or Baba will be president. They are two insignificant people. Okay. The Could people I... of Africa Coast have to be brought together. And that kind of approach, we can give more ideas to it. Thank you. All right. I think um, we'll take probably, all right. If you promise to make it 30 seconds, there and there, we'll have two quick questions. If not, I'll round up. OK, <laughs> sir, OK. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Colonel Wyatt. Uh, Minister Samakai's questions for you. Uh, the uh, 
that you've touched on something that's very astute that I think was largely is missed by a lot of people, not talked about a great deal. Using the phrase possession is nine tenths of the law, one of the biggest challenges for Liberia, and I'm hoping you could just briefly elaborate on progress, is land tenure. Um, possession is nine tenths of the law. That is all too common a process in Liberia. If you occupy it, you own it. And that's going to be a very explosive issue as time goes forward. We're talking about Liberia 10 or 15 years from now. So if you could elaborate on that success or progress. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll have the panel round up and I'll give each panelist uh, one minute, i.e. 60 seconds, to um, uh, respond to any or as many of the comments that they've heard and then the final word will go to the minister. We'll start with you, Jennifer, and walk our way down. Oh my. I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll respond briefly on Cote d'Ivoire and we can talk about the institutional legitimacy issues after the panel, but um, you know, I, I, it's a country coming out of conflict in which the international community, um, including ECOWAS, uh, was given an explicit role. And, and a country coming out of, of conflict, to a certain extent, gives up an element of its sovereignty. Um, and, and Bagbo signed, signed on to that when he signed the Ouagadougou Peace Agreement and the Pretoria Peace Agreement to allow the UN and ECOWAS to play a critical role in certifying uh, the results and in certifying the process is free and, and, and legitimate. And I think, I mean, it, it, it's there, I think, that we have to be paying more attention. Uh, I mean, I think Cote d'Ivoire is an instance where we have to be paying attention not just to elections, but to the many issues that lead up to elections. There are many moments in that peace accord uh, in terms of demobilization that Cote d'Ivoire is still going to have to, to uh, contend with at some point, identity and so forth. That, that the international community kind of turned a blind eye to, and then when the election came and, it's, and, and the rubber hits the road, we're at a loss for, for the mechanisms to resolve this. So that's what I'd say, say on that, um, and uh, just wrap up there. Okay. Mike? Yeah, I'll continue on the Cote d'Ivoire theme because it's appropriate in this forum to discuss this, and, and, it, and it does have an immediate impact on our, our, our view of how the security systems are coming together in Liberia. We, we, we have, the international community has made very clear that there are a number of uh, principles that have to be adhered to in this process. Uh, the Election Commission did its work, it certified the United Nations, the African Union, and ECOWAS, with ECOWAS in the clear lead, has, had, um, has noted that these were legitimately conducted and the results were what the results were. The, uh, recently, the AU high-level panel even gave another additional stamp of approval to the process and has judged uh, Ouattara to be the president legitimately elected in Cote d'Ivoire. It's end of the discussion at this stage. We really need to go to a process that has to be holistic. I think to answer your point, uh, the Ouattara administration needs to be reaching out across the spectra in Cote d'Ivoire to ensure that not just the, the, the North, Southerners and other uh, across the spectrum are addressed in terms of his administration of the presidency and the way forward in Cote d'Ivoire. And that will be the best interests of Liberia <laughs> and the other uh, states of Africa. Well, I think that um, Michael and Jennifer have made the case for Cote d'Ivoire in a very eloquent way, I would just like to add one thing. I mean, when you see the humanitarian impact of this, whether Mr. Bogbo feels that he's been robbed or not, uh, what has happened to the people that he was supposed to have governed is, is something that none of us can ignore, and nor can he. And so I think that um, it, it is in everyone's interest for the situation to be resolved as quickly as possible. And I would hope then that his colleagues in the African Union and ECOWAS can prevail upon him to come to some sort of peaceful solution as quickly as possible. Well, let me express my thanks and appreciation uh, for this opportunity to have been able to share with you uh, the topic on the discussion and to thank the uh, Raymond and his colleagues for inviting us uh, uh, today. Uh, I will hope that uh, you will recognize that the reform process, the security sector reform process in Liberia is still ongoing. It is still incomplete. It still needs to go ahead and uh, continue its team because there are many challenges now and more to come. 
uh, later. The issue of land, it is a still a very serious issue. It, the president has set up a land commission. She has done some uh, different kinds of mediation efforts, involved intervention efforts, and hopefully they will try to mitigate some of these, some of these concerns. Liberia stand ready to um, continue to support the ECOWAS position. And we do recognize the constraint that we have in meeting about our own internal security challenges, particularly at a point where um, our borders are very porous and it's very challenging for us to be able to police the entire borders unless we get the kind of international support that is needed. Whatever resolution that is required to bring peace to La Côte d'Ivoire needs to be done sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. I think the um, panel has, been, has given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, not all our questions have been answered. And one outstanding question is um, looking forward, how do we know we're making progress? And one of the questioners mentioned the voluntary principles for security sector reform. We need to start thinking about benchmarks that will let us know that um, Liberia is on, the right is on the right road and that security sector reform is closely aligned not just with um, national integrity issues but national development issues. And I think that those are issues that will continue to um, um, concern us and engage us. Um, the broader sub-regional issues, um, not just Cote d'Ivoire, but Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, are on the front burner. They should remain on the front burner. But I think that as we look at um, security sector reform in a particular country, I think it is really wise and prudent to think about its broader implications, not just in terms of overspill issues, but also in terms of what we could learn from Liberia to apply elsewhere. Well, uh, once more join me in thanking um, CSIS for, um, for co-hosting with us, thanking CSIS staff and USIP staff for supporting this event, and thanking uh, KRL for being a really strong backbone. Join me in thanking the panel and thank you for coming. <laughs>